Apex Express, Asian Pacific Expression. Community and cultural coverage, music and calendar, new visions and voices, coming to you with an Asian Pacific Islander point of view. It's time to get on board the Apex Express. And welcome to Apex Express, news and views with an API point of view. Coming up tonight on Apex is an end-of-the-year harvest show dedicated to small and family farmers and fisher people around the world. From rural farmers in Asia to backyard gardeners here in Oakland to crabbers and shrimpers in the Gulf Coast. We have a series of powerful short discussions with three Bay Area farmers, young people and elders, about their experiences farming and gardening and what it's meant for them culturally and politically. And then we'll take a very quick musical break with creative music by the group Mutual Aid Project, a Bay Area trio made up of Tracy Wee, Nikki, Nick Obando, and Marshall Trammell. And finally, a segment on fisher people in Coden, Alabama, who are forming a seafood cooperative and fighting for safe seafood a year and a half after the BP oil spill. We're your hosts, Marie Choi and Carl Jagbunnitsingh. You're listening to Apex Express. Stay tuned. As people of Asian Pacific Islander descent, farming and harvesting food is a critical piece of our cultures and histories. To some, learning how to grow our own food, especially cultural foods, is an act of reclaiming our culture and connection to land. Here in the Bay Area, there are many Asian Pacific Islander farmers and gardeners, from people who work on large-scale farms to those of us who harvest from planter boxes in the backyard. On tonight's show, we celebrate farming and the harvest and what it means to our communities. We'll hear three stories from Bay Area gardeners, API, Asian Pacific Islanders, with distinct backgrounds and reason, reasons for growing food. They talk about why they started farming, why it's important to them, and what advice and techniques they have to offer. The first up is Eileen Suzara, a longtime Filipina community organizer living in the East Bay. She speaks on growing up in the Mojave Desert, training through a farming program in Santa Cruz, and reclaiming her Filipina farming roots. My name is Eileen Suzara, and I'm a 27-year-old Filipina-American who was raised in Hawaii and California and now lives in the Bay Area. I first started gardening when I was seven, and at the time, our family was living in the Mojave Desert. And I remember just having this like little piece of land in our family home that I could do whatever I wanted with. So I remember just um, putting in seeds for the first time and how that got me hooked from a young age. And how has your connection to gardening or farming changed over time? See, over time, I would say that I I feel that I um, lost that early connection to the land in terms of actually putting things in the earth. And I remember you know, becoming involved around environmental justice organizing when I was in my late teens and early 20s. And that to me for a while felt like this is how I'm gonna connect to the earth. But as I've grown older, there's been this constant call to want to just actually put my hands in the earth again, put them in the dirt. Um, so I think my relationship now has been seeing how on a day-to-day -day basis can I feel more connected to the land? And what can that look like even if I'm living in an urban area and not in the desert or not in Hawaii anymore? How has gardening allowed you to connect to your culture? I think to me, farming, gardening, anything that involves growing food is at the heart of connecting to a culture. And for me as a Filipina, growing up in the U.S., out in the diaspora, it's been one way to regenerate what I can about um, our food ways. And it's been one way to, I think, feel more linked to my relatives in the Philippines, even though I'm here by just seeing the way that plants grow and, and having some sort of understanding of how they sustain us and how we sustain them too. Tell us about the Santa Cruz Farming Program. What was that? So I just came out a few weeks ago from um, a six-month intensive apprenticeship in Santa Cruz. 
It was at the Center for Agroecology and Sustainable Food Systems. It's kind of a mouthful. Um, but the program basically takes folks who are interested in, in farming and gardening sustainably, um, whether that means as, you know, a new farmer, as a garden educator, or someone who wants to work in food policy and agricultural policy. And you're there on the farm, you know, living, working side by side in community with folks and maintaining the operations of um, organic, sustainable farm. And so for me, it was a big step away from the reality that I had here in the Bay Area. You know, to be waking up every morning, you know, looking at the sun rising over the farm, to get more attuned with the, with the seasons here, and just to have the flow of the day kind of decided upon by what do the plants need. It just changed and transformed my relationship to California's environment. So now that you're back, how do you hope to take your experience? Where do you want to bring that? So being back here, I think I'm still going through like a withdrawal of not not being so directly connected feeling to the land. Um, What I want to do first and foremost um, is is actually the original reason why I did the farming program in the first place was this desire to be part of reclaiming and renewing Filipino American foodways by connecting it to back to the land. And what I want to do in the short term is to be doing um, more culinary workshops that are focused on nutritious Filipino foods um, that are using um, seasonal produce. And in the longer term, you know, this is this is a big dream, but I eventually want to envision having a piece of land that can serve as a demonstration site to be used for education, to be growing heirloom varieties, and to also link back to the health and culinary traditions that sustain our culture. One of my 2012 goals is to actually go to the Philippines and um, spend some time there learning some of the farming techniques there. And just to see, okay, so what can I be a part of bringing as a young woman of color, as a young Pinay um, back here um, from those lessons learned? We obviously live in a concrete jungle in the Bay Area. I mean, our reality is that we don't have access to rural land. Um, Why do you think it's important that people in the urban setting start gardening? I think no matter where we are, we still depend on food to survive. So I think maybe in a way this is also the survival spirit, but we can make food grow anywhere. Maybe not at the same scale, maybe not the same varieties, but we can make food grow anywhere. And I think um, it just takes extra creativity and thinking outside the box and also thinking within maybe some of our ancestral traditions to make food grow exactly where we are. And I think it's essential in a emotional and spiritual sense um, to have that connection to food. And then, you know, on a more pragmatic sense, it's part of keeping ourselves healthy and sane by having um, food and green things where we are for folks who are listening to our show do you have any advice for them and also resources Mm -hmm. that they can go to it's funny because i think about how seeds actually really just want to grow Mm -hmm. and you know when i used to make compost and to to teach composting workshops and people would get intimidated by the earthworms or get intimidated by the materials that used to compost Usually we just have to remind ourselves compost wants to decompose itself too. So I think I would just recommend to remember that everything we do has its own natural cycle. And we're just really there to like facilitate that. Mm -hmm. But we actually don't have to get in the way too much. And so things will grow if you just give them the basics. Resources, I think that especially in like Alameda County, I know that there's some great free workshops people can take to get their feet in the you know feet wet or hands in the dirt whatever you want to say there's a a master gardener training that you could take with alameda county san francisco there's a garden for the environment and there's groups like indigenous permaculture project in the bay area so i think there's a lot of places to turn um, to look for support and advice and then is there anything else that you want to add if i could just share a message out there i think What I'm always amazed and inspired and reminded by is that there is such a strong legacy of Asian Pacific Islanders in farming and that living and growing things sustainably is actually nothing new to us. So I would love and encourage to continue to see more API folks and especially young folks 
have our voices and stories heard in this movement um, because it's ours to share and we have a lot to offer and those stories deserve to be heard. And that was Eileen Suzara, interviewed by Apex contributor Ellen Choi. Next up in the short series is Steph Lee of Oakland. As a young Korean, Steph practices gardening while connecting to his family, his politics, and the struggle of growing food in Oakland's concrete jungle. My name is Steph Lee, and uh, I'm 29 years old, and I live in Oakland by the lake. So when did you first start gardening? I remember trying to garden growing up, like little things here and there, but it eventually all ended up in the death of the plant. <laughs> so I don't think I started actually gardening in earnest, um, maybe the, actually this year. What are some of those memories that you have gardening when you were little? Well, it was mostly to assist slash get in the way of my grandparents. So my um, grandfather in Korea, he was a landscaper. In fact, he would tell me stories of selling trees, like fruit trees on the stand and on the side of the road and having to speak Japanese, like learn, he had to speak Japanese because it was during occupation and how he sold trees and like made a little extra money during the occupation. And so he would try to teach me things outside as we'd plant things and I'd just play in the dirt <laughs> and not really know anything. But he would, I don't know, I guess I, I don't actually remember like specific things that he would actually teach me. But I think over, like, when I think back about my childhood, I do remember the ways that he would, you know, prune the leaves or the way my grandmother would tend to the indoor plants. And, you know, those things stay with me when I actually tend to my plants. It, it's like a way to connect with my grandparents again, even though my grandfather's passed. So it, I don't know, it, it stirs up a lot of memories that I didn't realize that I had. So what got you starting to garden again? I think I've always been kind of in awe of people who grow their own food. I felt super daunted by all of that. So sort of usually what I do, like a lot of people do, is just Google the crap out of stuff. <laughs> so I just did a lot of research. And there was a point where I realized that there was no way that I was going to set up a whole kind of farm in my tiny little yard. Um, so I just, I wanted to find something that was really manageable. And so I looked up some different things online and I came across this um, university program at the University of Maryland. And they have a whole agriculture program there. And a big part of their program is to get the community to start gardening, even if it's just like a little bit, just potting a plant, something. And they created this thing called a salad table. And it's really cool. It's really easy to build. It's like two by fours and you just throw in some media and um, you can grow a lot of food. So I think it was like one being inspired by the people around me. And then the other part was I was on unemployment for the last couple of years. I wanted to eat more fresh food, but it was really expensive. Or I would buy like, you know, they have those big old plastic things of like salad and I would never finish it. And so I kept, I would always be like, gosh, I've, if I could only just harvest the amount that I'm going to eat, that would be really great. So I wouldn't have to waste. And so the salad table was perfect because it was really easy. It was a way to start. And then, I, yeah. And then I got bit by the bug. Do you see gardening as being a political act? You know, initially I don't ever, really, I don't think I thought of it as a political act, but as I've, I don't know, developed a relationship to the food that I'm eating and also thinking about how amazed people are when you put food in front of them and you say, I grew this from seed. Also, my relationship to food is really different when I'm, you know, cutting that lettuce into my and putting it in my bowl, like in front of me to eat. You know, it, it's hard to actually cut it cut it because <laughs> I, I, I raised it. I took care of it every day and I have a relationship to it. And so there's this Korean word. And I think that's what I think of when I see it. It's got like, I don't know, it's like a combination of like magical and also like really special. And it, there's I kind of get that feeling when I see it. I appreciate it so much more and I think that's very political when you're able to have a relationship with your surroundings and the things that are in your life and the things that you utilize to sustain you. Mm -hmm. I feel like that is very much a political act. Mm -hmm. And of course, the necessity to grow these things because, you know, it's expensive to have 
you know, access to healthy food, green food, it's, yeah, it's definitely political. And I think the connection that I have to growing things as being sort of a connection to my history and the legacy of my family and the connection that I have to Korea is also a really big part that I also didn't expect. So I want to ask you about gardening as a renter and also in the city of Oakland because <laughs> you're you're doing both. And um, I know there's a lot of challenges. So what have been some challenges for you? So I live in a lot or I live my I live in a, a converted house. So there are two units and I live in the bottom unit and we share sort of the the outdoor area. And unfortunately, most of that area is paved over. And so there's very little ground space. And that was one of the reasons why I built the salad table is is I have a deck area and it's not too large and also it's easy to maintain and it, and my landlord isn't going to get upset about it. And I think that's the really hard thing for people who want to garden in a place like Oakland, where a lot of people are renting, where people are living on top of each other in these large buildings or condos or, you know, converted houses. And so trying to find ways to to build boxes that are manageable and also will produce food, I know can be hard, but also there are ways to work around it. And I think that's part of the really cool thing because people come over and take a look and they're like this this isn't that this is easy this looks cool and also it's something that i can do too and so i think that that's been the real benefit is actually being able to share it with other people too um given that you've gone through for about a year these challenges of um and picking up experience of growing in oakland so what's some advice that you would give either gardeners existing gardeners in oakland or people who are thinking about it for people who are thinking about it, since I was there not too long ago, I think the biggest thing is just putting something in the ground. I think that's the the best thing you can do because I, I definitely had some failed experiments. I tried to grow some, you know, seeds that were a little older or seeds that my mom gave me or just things that I picked up at randomly here and there. And some of, sometimes it didn't grow, but but most just most times it did and i think once i saw that stuff was growing that i just kind of like tossed in the ground that's when i got super excited and started researching more stuff and um the other thing too is actually growing with other people i think that's the best best thing you can do cuz you can share maybe grow other things so you can trade <laughs> and um can trade stories or advice and i think that's the it's it's good to, when growing can can be a communal thing. So that's it. But is there anything else you wanted to tell? Maybe if there's like um, cool online resources you found. Yeah, if you just look up salad table, that's that's where I got the plans for the salad table. And then there's also the self watering container, which I didn't mention before. But I've built some self watering containers where if you're prone to letting your plants die from not remembering to water them there's this and it's so liberatory if you think about it because you're allowing the plant to to nourish itself mm -hmm. so the plant decides how much water it needs and it's not up to you the water giver but it's up to the plant wow. to feed itself which is kind of really it's kind of amazing yeah, yeah. so the self watering container <laughs> and that's i mean there are plants for that all over the place on the internet if you look look for that and that was the voice of Steph Lee, second in our API Harvest series. We have a third and final segment coming up, but first, here's a classic from the 70s. It's Yellow Pearl with the song Free the Land. <laughs> Was Free the Land by Yellow Pearl, whose members are progressive singers and songwriters Chris Sajima, Joanne Nobuko, Miyamoto, and Charlie Chin. And now our final segment in our series of interviews with Bay Area gardeners, Arsenia Malinas shares her memories of growing up on a farm in the Philippines and the passion for farming she brought to the United States. She's being interviewed by her son, Armel Malinas. Uh, my name is Arsenia Malinas. I'm from Vallejo, California. So I hear you have a beautiful garden in your backyard in Vallejo. How many years have you had this garden? I thank you for giving me time to share my passion in gardening. 
This is our hobby for years. We have this garden since we moved to this house in 1994. We planted uh, fruit trees uh, in December of the same year, 1994. Overall, we have 32 fruit trees in our backyard, like apples, we have pears, we have tangerines, plums, cherries, apricot, oranges, persimmons, avocados, grapes, guava and nectarines and others so what are you growing right now uh, this is a summer time we grew green leafy vegetables like collard green uh, kale spinach mustards beans uh, bok choy yam white and yellow squash eggplants uh, bell peppers tomatoes herbs like uh, rosemary basil mint and so many others so you mentioned that you started gardening in the Philippines. Can you share some of your experiences in gardening in the Philippines? As far as I remember, I started gardening when I was very young, in 1946. Because my father was a farmer in Mindanao, the southern part of the Philippines, and my mother also is a housewife who helped him in the farm. I was the youngest in the family and I was not in school yet. So I would uh, go with them and help them with their daily work in our farm, which was a stone threw away from our house. So speaking of the Philippines, I hear that 75% of the population are peasants and farmers, which mean uh, those that work the land. Um, however, many of these farmers don't own the land because of big landlords. Um, and landlessness is one of the major issues um, in uh, the Philippines right now. So can you share a little bit about how your family used a farm as a source of income? Our land was inherited from my grandparents who treated for the land with indigenous people of Plaridel, Misamis Occidental, which is a southern part of the Philippines in Mindanao. And we have a small uh, sugar plantation. And I remember my father used to make a brown sugar out of the sugar cane juice using a crude way of making the brown sugar using a carabao. We call it water buffalo here to turn the big uh, wooden uh, tube to squeeze the juice. And after that, my father has to caramelize it until it became sticky. And then he spread it on the table and he will continuously stir it until dry. My father will seal it as a source of income for my brother who were in college. My tatai and my nanai have put six uh, children through college because of their farming. And we are exposed to uh, farming because we live in the farm and the product we have is one of our source of income. What are some of the memories you have uh, in terms of farming in the Philippines? I used to uh, go with my mother uh, during the planting season because... <clears throat> And I also learned some tradition which was passed down from my grandparents. And we used to follow the almanac, which uh, told us when the best time to plant fruit trees and vegetables to bear abundant uh, fruits, like planting before full moon and during low, low, low tide, so it will produce uh, abundant fruits which succeed to be true. And we have to put uh, full rocks in the hole while planting the uh, planting trees so that the tree will spread its roots to the side to get some nutrients from the soil to produce more fruits. My mother will uh, put some uh, a tablespoon of sugar on the ground before planting and to make the fruit sweet, which was said to be true. And we use compost soil to fertilize our plants. We never use any commercial uh, fertilize that time because it was so expensive. And the fruits were so natural and sweet. And we have organic foods from our garden. So why was it important for you to start a garden when you immigrated here from the Philippines? 
We started gardening in the uh, U.S. When we moved here, way back in 1985, because I was I want to use fresh vegetables without any fertilizers or toxins because there are so many elements that can cause disease like cancer and heart disease, uh, blood pressure, high cholesterol, and diabetes. I am a nurse for 45 years. And from my experience, the best medicine is the healthy and natural foods. Due to our diet and the Filipino community, there are lots of ailments like diabetes and high blood pressure. So it's important to put in a healthy food into your body. So the, I hear you also saved seeds or you brought seeds with you when you came here to the U.S. Um, how did you bring those seeds and what seeds did you bring? As far as... Uh, Seeds. We brought some uh, better melon seeds, beans, white and yellow squash, okra, because those are a uh, tropical vegetable vegetables where I spread it into my luggage and I wrap it with a tin foil and in my luggage. So you uh, also mentioned that you save seeds now. Um, so how do you save the seeds that you have, and what? process do you use to save the seeds? For preserving uh, seeds, I have to pick the best fruit from the, from summertime, which is the harvest time. We store it in a container or a jar to use it for the next planting season. And we keep it all our seeds in a shade where it is not too hot or not too cold. Um, so why do you think it's important that your children learn to garden um, and they start a garden of their own in their own house? I like to encourage my son and my daughter to plant some green vegetables in their backyard so it could u- use it in their daily diet. And it also teaches them to understand how and where the food comes from. Cultivating and planting is when you see plants grow is very fulfilling. Harvesting fruits of your labor and hard work are the principles that I want to pass down to my kids. So how much time do you spend in your garden now and what's your favorite thing to grow? And I almost I spent most of my time gardening because I'm retired. And I also plant flowers around like perennial and annual plants and some orchids to balance the beauty of our backyard. I love seeing my plants bearing fruits. To me, it's kind of a complacement that fruits are hanging in the trees and I could share to our neighbors, our friends, our church members, relatives, and preserve them. And ultimately, it helps our environment to grow our own food and grow plants locally. All right, thank you for your time. We are welcome. That was Armel Molinas interviewing his mother, Arsenia Molinas, about the 50 years she spent gardening in Vallejo and in the Philippines. Thanks so much to Ellen Choi for bringing us this series. And now we'll get a small creative taste of some music brought to us by the Mutual Aid Project, a trio made up of Marshall Trummel, Tracy Hui, and Nico Bondo. They formed Mutual Aid Project to be an artistic and political platform to bridge communities, unravel musical histories, and affect the world we share. Here's a piece from the track called Thank You.
listening to a clip from Thank You by the Mutual Aid Project. You can catch them at Decolonizing the Imagination, an arts practicum and exhibition. The event is on Saturday, January 7th from 5 to 7 p.m. at the Omero Art Gallery, 414th Street at Franklin in Oakland. For more information or to hear more of their music, check out their website, www.mutualaidproject.com. And for our final segment of the night, we'll go to Mobile Bay, Alabama, an area that is home to many Gulf Coast fisher people. We'll hear about how many of them are having trouble and how they're surviving a year and a half after the worst of the BP oil spill, an oil spill that continues to leak oil into the Gulf to this very day. It was around 6.30 when we finally rolled into Coden, Alabama. The building looked like a warehouse set back from the road with South Bay Communities Alliance across the front in big block letters. Zach Carter came out to greet us. He wore an old Auburn University cap over his white hair. He'd gotten up before the sun that day, getting ready for a big event where dozens of local fisher people would testify about the effects of the oil spill on their lives and livelihoods. I followed him into his office. The room was sparse with a folding chair and desk in the middle. On the desk, there were stacks of paper and framed photos of family and friends. This is my son. <laughs> he graduated from high school a couple of years ago. You can tell that he was a class clown. I'm not sure where he got that from. <laughs> he's 20, he's 18 years old there. He's 20 now. And he finally decided to go to college. He's at uh, the University of Colorado, Denver. And he spent a couple of years with his rock and roll bands. And this, these are, um, these are my parents and grandparents. You can see some of the Alabama Cajun and, and my mom. She's beautiful. Ah, thank you. Yeah. I lost her when I was 19. Mm. It's my dad and my grandparents. His family comes from the mountains of North Alabama. This is 1920. Mm -hmm. As uh, my great-great-grandfather uh, great and his wife. And a lot of people don't realize, but the mountainous areas of Alabama... They refused to, to join the Confederate Army. In fact, the, the county, Winston County, July 4th, 1862, declared its independence of the Confederacy. And most of the Southern whites in, in North Alabama, or a large number, fought for the Union. If you add together the African Americans who escaped from slavery and the Southern whites who went to the other side, quote the other side, the real, the real side, a third of Southerners fought for the Union. When we got to photos of local fisher people, the conversation quickly turned to whether or not Gulf seafood was safe. She was on the boat with Sidney Schwartz. We went, went out there for eight hours. We drugged for shrimp, and he's agreed to have his shrimp tested for oil. The feds and the state and BP, they're all saying, oh, it's fine, go out there, you know. All shrimpers, they're under a lot, and other fishers and crabbers like syrup porn, they're under a lot of pressure just to shut up and go along with the Pollyanna reports that everything's fine. This point came up over and over in conversations with everyone we met in Mobile Bay. You'll hear more about it in a few minutes. We left the office and drove down a dirt road to Bayou Cotton to catch the sunset. Zach told us that when the rig exploded, the oil traveled 16 miles inland from the coast and into the bayou we were standing in. It made sense given how much oil had been dumped into the Gulf during the spill. In April 2010, when the oil rig exploded, it dumped 4.9 million barrels of oil into the Gulf. That's over 50,000 barrels of oil a day. I don't know where we are anymore. We're headed west. Somewhere. After driving through Coden and Bayou Labatri, we met up with Sirapon Hall and Min Lei, crabbers and shrimpers who are involved with the South Bay Communities Alliance. I got in Sirapon's pickup with her, getting in whatever conversation I could before it got too late. Sirapon had lived and worked all over the Southeast, coal mining in Kentucky, a candle factory, sewing factory, and chicken packaging plant in Georgia, a Walmart warehouse in Tennessee. Which of those jobs did you like the most? Uh, the most job I ever like is the best job I love it is 
in Nashville, Tennessee. I uh, work in the uh, warehouse. We're packing, you know, for Walmart. I love it because it seems like I get paid to be exercised all night long. I get the order, then I pick up the order and look, you know, see what they need, what they wanted. Then I go pick up, you know, put in the, in the boxes. Mm-hmm. And the person just wrap them and then I pick up new boxes and new order and go around again. Oh, I love it. Because I get to walk all night, you know, and eight hours. Sometimes I work 10 hours a day. What job did you dislike the most? Coal mine. <laughs> Where were you doing that? I do that coal mine in uh, Kentucky, Eastern Kentucky. They call uh, Pineville, Kentucky. Why didn't you like it? Because too danger. <laughs> too danger and too hard for me. But I need to work in that time because, you know, uh, I just have my kid, put my kid in the school. And my mom want to come to the United States. My brother want to come to the United States and I try to make some money to go get my mom and my brother to come to the United States. That's what I <laughs> need to make some money that time. I asked Sirupan how she'd ended up crabbing in Mobile Bay. She said she was working at a chicken packaging plant in Georgia, and along with many of the other women who worked there, she was diagnosed with breast cancer. After she completed her treatment, she applied again for a job at the chicken plant, and they refused to hire her back. None of the factories in town would give her a job. So then I just uh, come down here to Alabama. My family live here by the battery. I come down, visit them, and after that, you know, uh, they asked me to go on the crab boat with him. I go in the crab boat with them one day, and next day I go out buy my own boat, buy my own trap, and start my own business. <laughs> wow. <laughs> we do real good, you know, for last like four years, five years. Then when the BP all spill, then the factory, the one buy the crab off of me all the time, they don't open back, both of them. They don't open back. Then after that, when I go back home with my crab, then I... So much problem, I can't find nobody to buy it. Especially right now. Someday people buy, someday they don't want to buy. And that's disappointed, you know, and heartache. I wish, you know, the, something like it never happened, you know, with the BP or spill, stuff like that. Because we're happy, we used to work, you know, and... It was dark when we arrived at our destination. It was a big dirt parking lot on the waterfront, surrounded by long abandoned industrial buildings. There was a huge piece of machinery, two stories high, on one side of the lot. It was tearing apart old oil derricks. That's the noise you'll hear in the background. Where are we? In Bayula Badri. But what is this place? It's the processors. Uh, Seafood processors. Seafood processors, fuel docks, ice. This is ice machines right here. This right here in their offices. And there's a processing up there, and they also have a net shop here as well. So they very versatile. This this operation, it's pretty good, good size at one time. And they also have still in good shape fuel tanks, mm-hmm. fuel lines running, you know, all the way out here to the dock. We can walk around the docks, you can mm-hmm. see. And this ice also pump from there to here, to the pipe, right, right. underground. When did this place close? I don't know. I've been here over 10 years, uh, 11 years, and um, they probably closed before that. So Min said we could get on his boat. Just had to get on this uh, work boat here and climb that scaffold and then jump over. It's real easy. You ready? <laughs> so you're going up this thing. So I'm going to have a ladder for you. How about we give the equipment to somebody? I'm not going up this ladder unless somebody holds it for me. On the boat, most of our conversation centered around the seafood economy and the oil spill. Shortly after the spill, BP had set up a program called Vessels of Opportunity that would compensate fisher people who had lost their livelihoods in exchange for helping with the cleanup effort. Now, to me, the, the, the Vessel Opportunity the program, I think, is a joke. Why? Because they're not really doing the job like it should be when we started. Six o'clock in the morning, we go, we report in, and they say, okay, go out there close to three miles looking for oil. There is no particular point that each boat or a group of boats have to go to. They just run out there. 
So they said, looking for oil. And then what happens if you find oil? Uh, well, it's, you're supposed to report in to the command, uh, uh, you know, command station so they can send uh, the, uh, the oil I and mean, a, a group of cleaning up, go out there and clean up the oil, right? I had um, a couple of shrimpers tell me once toward the end of the Vessels of Opportunity program that they had actually seen a huge blob of oil floating just north at Dolphin Island, about 100 square yards of it. The vessel of opportunity was was trimming down at that point. Their shift ended at 1 o'clock. They were trying to scoop up the oil with dip nets. When you say dip nets, you mean like pool dip net? Dip net, yeah. yeah. This, is, this is a net that's sitting on top of the deck over there. That's the that's a dip net that we actually, they have the issues to us. When oil is spotted, and then they're scooping it up with the dip nets, and then toward the end of their shift, then, well, they're called back in. There's nobody to replace them. They see work boats coming out with these rooster tail sprays of dispersant. The dispersants that Zach was referring to were part of the core exit product line made by a company called Nalco. The chemicals break up the crude oil and sink the oil into the sediments on the ocean floor the same sediment that crab and shrimp live in. These dispersants were also used after the Exxon Valdez spill and were linked to health problems, including respiratory, nervous system, liver, kidney, and blood disorders. In high doses, one of the dispersants caused headaches, vomiting, and reproductive problems. After the BP spill, over 600,000 gallons of core exit dispersants were dumped into the Gulf. Shrimpers and crabbers reported these incidents to various government entities, and eventually BP was ordered to find a less toxic, more effective alternative. But there were other problems with the Vessels of Opportunity program. Here's Zach. There's 5,000 licensed fishers in the area. About 20% of those fishers were signing petitions, social justice petitions last summer. Some of them were even blocking by La Battery in protest. About 700 fishers that were, had independent contracts with BP to clean up, you know, vessels of opportunity. So they were making pretty decent money. And then the, the city of Bile Battery then got together with BP and took all those contracts and put them under the control of J&W Marine. The supervisor was the mayor's brother. <laughs> Their salaries were cut in half. Their wages were cut in half, you know, for me. My what point, was that? The good old boy. <laughs> As the Vessels of Opportunity program was wrapping up, just six months after the spill, President Obama took a trip along the Gulf Coast to assure people that Gulf seafood was safe. Beaches all along the Gulf Coast are clean, they are safe, and they are open for business. This was part of a massive media effort to convince the public that the crisis was over. Here's an excerpt from ABC's report. When the New Orleans Saints go to the White House today, they will be served shrimp and oyster po'boys. Yesterday, the, uh, the president barbecued Gulf shrimp. All of this part of a massive effort to show that this stuff is still safe. I'm eating a lot of it. I continue to eat it. I trust the protocols. What we have found so far is there is nothing showing up that is outside of the realm of normal. That was the voice of Janet Woodka senior policy advisor with the Environmental Protection Agency. Over the next few months, government agencies, scientists, and industry people came out in every major media outlet, declaring that Gulf seafood was safe to eat. But the people we talked with up and down the coast, a full year after these media reports, told us otherwise. I'd like to know that. At least somebody needs to tell me the truth. It's about two weeks after the oil spill, the scientists, local scientists, got paid by the BP grants to sit in the front of the podium and tell all of us this seafood is safe to eat. That just a few weeks after the spill. And at the same time, we kind of asked them, are you willing to consume or are you consume the seafood? Well... The person actually hesitated to answer all questions. Recently, about uh, four or five days ago, we have crab out of 
this water here. It died in a trap. All of them died in a trap, and we don't know why. When I mention it, somebody all said that it happened in Biloxi as well. That crap is dying in a trap. We never have crap dying in a trap before. In a way, you can see why do I hesitate to consume the, the, the seafood. I mean, I really hate to say it because this is my livelihood. These weren't the only stories we heard. Other people told us about tar balls washing up on the shore and schools of fish they'd never seen coming up to the shoreline. That means it's still bad out there. The fish know it, they'd tell us. When we met this summer, Min, Sirapan, and others were in the process of having their seafood tested. If they were tested, then we can tell the public, yes, there is an independent sign or test office who is a safe or not safe. At least that way, we have a quality assurance right. of our product when we sell to the consumer. And also, it makes me feel much better because I don't want to sell a, a, a bad product mm -hmm. to a consumer. They may get them sick. What do you think is making the difference for people between people? Most people probably aren't having their seafood tested. So for the people who actually are, why are they doing that? They're looking at the long term. Sydney's a fourth generation shrimper, and his son is, works on his boat sometimes as a deckhand. His dad taught him how to shrimp. There are a lot of people that are under pressure not to say anything, you know. That every what are those pressures? To make a living. I mean, it's like, you know, imagine for a moment if the only thing you could do is uh, say you're making cars and then you know that there's something unsafe for those cars. But it's already come out in the news that, oh, no, it's not unsafe. But you know in your heart it is, you know, and your government's not backing you up and that company is saying if you... Open your mouth, you're going to be fired. Uh, do you understand the analogy? I mean, that's what's going on here. But just like that automaker, she would understand that that company's got to exist and the market's got to exist for his, his or her product so they can continue to make a living. And so that maybe if their children want to do this, I don't know how good of an analogy is because I think it's a much more noble thing to be a, a farmer of the sea, you know? And at the same time, you're protecting this environment. In addition to health and safety issues, the oil spill had created an economic crisis for shrimpers, crabbers, and fisher people who make their living on the sea. Men explained the economics. The price in the grocery stores is always high. So where's the money go? So the, the answer to that is mostly is passed through the middle. A good example. Uh, price been dropping tremendously. A, a dollar, somewhere, somewhere it would be a dollar a pound recently. Why? A dollar a pound for what? Shrimp. The market never changed. If you go in a grocery store, the price is still the same or higher. But the price for the producers always change, but it never really go up that fast. But the price at the retailer always increase, never decrease. So where's the profit went to? Fisher people have very little say in this process. You come in with a lower shrimp, mm, let's just say 20, 30,000 pounds, and your fuel is low. And the price before you went out, maybe, for an example, $5 a pound. When you come in a month later, and they say, well, now we're going to give you $4 a pound, or three and a half, doesn't matter. Uh, you had no choice except to sell because now you have a low but you didn't have any fuel what are you going to do with 20, 30,000 pounds or more of shrimp on board so basically you between a rock and a hard place you had nothing to say about that the Gulf seafood industry was suffering even before the oil spill with government tax breaks seafood processors were increasingly buying seafood from Thailand, China and other countries but crabbers and shrimpers in the Gulf were still able to make a living. Since the oil spill, people have been having a hard time finding buyers at all. Here's Pon. Travel good days, hard and disappointed, you know, out there, and so rough and hard work that when you have with the crab to come back and you can't find a place to sell it. When they can sell their catch, they don't make enough to make ends meet. The first time when I started, the fuel was 38 cents a gallon. Now it's $3.50 a gallon. And the shrimp price now is actually 
less than from 38 cents a gallon. So you can see the situation for the producer, the shrimper, the fish, uh, pretty much in a hard. From their perspective, the only people making money in this business are the processors and, ironically, the oil companies. According to Min, we're all slaves to the system. Min, Pond, Zach, and other fisher people in Mobile Bay are trying to create their own economic liberation in the form of a seafood cooperative. They have big dreams of buying the land that Min's boat was docked on, the abandoned seafood processing plant. They say the foundation of the building is strong and there's room for plenty of boats to dock. Most importantly, having a co-op would allow fisher people to have a little more control over their own economic survival. I like that idea because, you know, a lot of people, we struggle. We don't have no place to sell our product, you know, when we have it. Then when we sell it, people always cut the price, you know. Right now, I sell my crab only uh, 50 cents for pound. I can barely make it, you know, how to get the price for my boat and food to eat and, you know, home to stay and all that. I can hardly make it. If we have, you know, like a food process like he gotta make bigger so he can set the price you know certain price so we can make a living decent then after that all we do is just have it we don't worry about our work don't worry about where we can sell it we buy that and we get the fish and crab then we sell to them with the decent price fair price so we you know that before we go to bed you know say so, okay we have a work tomorrow and we have a place to sell our whatever we catch so we no longer slave to us do we work for ourselves we are independent does that mean you're free? Yes, we are free. To learn more about the South Bay Communities Alliance and how people in the Gulf are surviving, visit www.bridgethegulfproject.org. Special thanks to Trin Lei and Diana Wu for making these interviews possible, and to Min, Pon, and Zach for sharing their stories with us. Marie Che, Apex Express, Bayou Labatri, Alabama. Thanks also to ConFam for her help in making these interviews possible. That brings us to the end of tonight's show. Tune in next week to Apex Express at 7 o'clock right here on KPFA 94.1 FM. To find archive shows, visit our website, apexexpress.org. Special thanks again to Marie Che and Ellen Choi for holding it down here at Apex on Apex Express. And on behalf of Apex Express, I'd like to remind us that during this holiday harvest time, this winter solstice and new year, we remember those who are no longer with us. We give thanks to those who've paved the way. We're grateful for each other. Our thoughts and prayers go out to those who struggle. And we're also very hopeful of the possibilities of new tomorrows and the sustainable, just, and loving world that we build together. With the Shaolin B-Boy holding down the controls from below and to the left, we've been your hosts, Marie Che and Kajik Bunasing. Thanks for joining us tonight on Apex Express. Stay tuned for The Bonnie Simmons Show.